The demonstrator for this video is not wearing a respirator and safety glasses to facilitate the production of this video. Whenever working with chemicals or performing any activity that disturbs paint on a structure built prior to 1978, it is important to always wear proper safety equipment, to lay out adequate protection to collect any debris that may be generated, and to prevent children, pets, and others from entering the work area. Every owner of an older home has had to deal with the issue of wood maintenance. I've brought a few examples of some deteriorated wood here, and we're going to take a look at what's caused the deterioration and some fixes that are appropriate for historic homes. My first example, as you can see along the end grain, has been infected by uh, insect infestation, which has eaten out all the different soft parts of the lumber here, and basically degraded the integrity of the bottom portion of this post. Second piece here, you can see some rot that started to occur along this piece where the wood has been exposed to moisture and both rot, brown mold, white mold, and a lot of different other things can get in and really degrade the wood fibers. All these things have in common is the fact that they have been exposed to moisture. Bugs can't live in wood that doesn't have an excess amount of moisture. Mold can't grow in wood that doesn't have an excess amount of moisture. And rot doesn't happen without moisture as well. So the important thing to remember is Always look for where the water is coming from and find out how to mitigate that before you worry about how to repair all your lumber. I bet many homeowners who have wood windows have seen a sill that looks like this. Lots of checks and cracking across the face of it, and many people wonder if this can even be saved. Well, I've got a few products that I brought along, and while I'm not recommending these, I have used these in the past with great success. This is the Abitron product, and this is going to be an epoxy. Everything with the Abitron system is two parts, 50-50 solution. So this is their liquid wood product, which consolidates the wood. You mix these two together in a 50-50 solution and you apply it to the wood and it'll basically harden up much of the wood fibers so that they can be properly restored. Here's a piece that I've applied previously and you can see where the brown here is soft and flaking off. And over here where the wood is darker is where I've applied the consolidant and it's much harder and stiffer. Now this white blob you see over here is some epoxy from the same system. This is also a two-part system. The idea here being you take equal sized balls of the two different products and you're going to work them together to form a cohesive paste. Now I'd certainly like to point out that there are other materials on the market. I like Abitron for when there is a large gap to fill or if I'm trying to rebuild some particular piece of wood that's been lost. But there are others that work better as a skim coat when you're just trying to fill in the gaps. Uh, for example, like you see here on the checked face. So you work the material together until you don't see any streaks of one color or the other. And then in the case of this, where you can see where the original wood rotted off along the side here, you remove the rotted wood back to a reasonable layer, apply your consolidant, and then you can put on the epoxy to rebuild it out to its nice original shape. And that's just done by simply placing it in here and pressing it into place. One of the benefits I've found with this product is that once it's good and hard, if you would like to do additional work to it, like if you want to square this up more, you can actually take a chisel to it and it will hold nails. And you can sand it just like wood and paint it just like wood. So in this piece here, this could be purely a decorative piece, or it could be the bottom portion of a column. If you've got a section of your column that's cracked off and you don't want to cut up uh, too far into your column, you can fill this in and it will hold uh, nicely for that particular purpose. Um, but it also does do a good job of filling in things like the checked surfaces of uh, sills and other areas where you're trying to um, basically level out an area that's been lost to a lot of deterioration. I have here another example where you can see just the consolidant placed on the checked surface. As you can see from these fingers here that expand across the grain, this is where the wood has been checked and it's been cracking as it shrinks over time. And the consolidated portion here, the consolidant has gotten into these little fingers and filled them so as to stop that additional deterioration from occurring. And the portions along the bottom um, that have not been consolidated, you can see that it's still just an open crack and will continue to crack over time. So what do you do if you've got an issue where epoxy isn't going to be an appropriate solution for you? Let's say you've got a porch post or a beam across the top here, as you can see on this home, has got these uh, angled beams. That's just completely rotted away. There's no more material here, or if your porch post looks like this on the bottom and is just uh, sort of dangling there. Well, in that case, you can actually do a replacement member. And, well, original wood 
such as the wood you're going to find on most historic homes, is typically going to be made out of old growth lumber, which means it has a very dense ring pattern, and it's going to be much more sturdy and stable wood than what's commercially available today. So even if you've got a pine post on your porch, I wouldn't recommend using a off-the-shelf pine piece from a local lumber yard. You'd probably want to try to find something like a ponderosa pine, which is a more dense lumber, or even a mahogany. For this particular demonstration, I've selected a replacement member that's a lot lighter so that it's a little bit easier to see what I'm doing. If you're replacing something like a porch column, where you've got something like this, just a few inches that need to be replaced, you can just cut straight across and patch in a new member with a butt joint, which will look like this. It's important to try to match the definition of the wood so that you've got a nice plumb surface here. To attach this, you're going to glue between and toenail in some nails, so coming in from this side and from this side to make a nice stable connection. Another option, if you've got something that's going to be uh, at an angle or has more lateral forces at work, is a scarf joint, which is what I've demonstrated here. There are a few different advantages to a scarf joint over a butt joint. First of all, you've got a much wider surface area here to apply glue and to allow you to also screw these two members together to bind them well. The scarf joint will resist both pressures on a downwards way and will also do a good job of resisting pressures on an angle because of the way these two members are joined together. So we've seen what water can do to wood. It allows insects to infiltrate, it allows rot to occur, and it can allow mold to grow as well. We've also seen a couple of good recommendations for how to fix those things by applying an epoxy with a consolidant and the actual epoxy itself and by doing some replacement pieces. By utilizing these tools, you'll be able to retain as much of the original fabric with your home and maintain the authenticity of your historic home. So here's an introduction to some of the tools that are useful during any kind of woodworking project. First up is a good old-fashioned chisel. Very handy for when you just need to get a few little pieces or smoothing done on a piece of wood. Or if you need to get a nice notch cut out. Carbide scraper, great way to get paint off of the old home. Um, but of course, with any home built prior to 1978, you want to be aware of the lead hazard. So anytime you're using something that's going to be affecting old paint on your home, you want to make sure that you're both wearing a lead-approved respirator and that you have an adequate amount of plastic on the ground that can help catch any lead chips that you're making. Of course, if you're having someone do this work for you, make sure that they're EPA lead safe certified. Speaking of scraping paint, many people have questions about how do you get the paint off of those little odd profiles that some of the old trim has. There are a different variety of scrapers out there that can help you get into any kind of little different OG curve or any other curve that you might have on your trim. And this one comes with a few different types of blades that you can use. The plane, very good if you're trying to make a new piece of wood that's supposed to replicate the original and you've got something that has like a rounded corner. You don't necessarily need power tools for everything. Here is a power tool. It's a little Dremel Multimax, but there's different manufacturers that make the same thing. Really good for plunge cutting. You can see that it's got this narrow blade that's very thin. And if you've got just a small section of wood that you want to cut out, I use this for making a cut where you can just cut in straight and you can just cut out like a little square inch if you need to. And that's great for getting into tight little corners. And this is another suggestion that I've got, especially when you're trying to find out exactly where the problem areas are in your home. Just a little probe, a little steel spike. You can also use a screwdriver or anything else that's got a nice stiff little tip to go around and probe, find out which areas of your wood are pretty solid and which areas are not. So here's a good example of where moisture is hitting the ground and then splashing back up onto the building. And you can definitely see the evidence of that by all this dirt that's uh, splashed up all along this wood trim. Constant exposure to wood like this is going to be a good uh, catalyst for some of those uh, issues that we saw on the wood. So take my little probe here and of course try not to be too rough with it, but you can see the wood is nice and solid up here. And then when you get down to the bottom, it just starts digging in a little bit more. So you want to find some way 
perhaps to remove this ground, pull it back a little bit from the house so there's not as much water splashing up onto this uh, wood member here. Typically I'll look overhead to see if there's a clogged gutter because that's fairly common to see a gutter overflowing, splashing onto the ground. But since we're on the end gable here, uh, it's pretty obvious that this is just rainwater splashing against the ground, splashing back up. Another good option would be to have uh, some landscape gravel along the bottom to help remove the, the dirt that's splashing up all over the home. But definitely here, you'd want to make sure that this dirt is pulled back um, probably six to nine inches away from the first evidence of the wood here. And then you don't have to necessarily put in landscape gravel, but you can have um, some sort of uh, grass or if you want to put landscape gravel in that, no problem at all just as long as it's far enough away so that the water is not splashing back onto the wood. So here's a good example of where you would probably want to just cut off directly, since this is more of a decorative uh, stop for the garage door. Cut this off straight and then put a new piece of wood in, since obviously there's not much there left. Now other things here, yep, yeah, there's a, a piece of wood basically butted up directly against the ground. And as you can see, there's not a lot left going on in here. So what you could do, and it does get stiffer up here, is cut off the section that's bad along through here, uh, carefully just excavating the pieces that are in bad shape, dig out the dirt, and replace this with an epoxy consolidant. The benefit there is that the epoxy consolidant doesn't have the uh, wicking action that no natural wood does, so it's not going to pull moisture up into the wood above, so it creates a little bit of a barrier for you as well. It's not too bad on the outside edge, but it starts disappearing right in there. So here you can see the soffit, um, where there's some pretty obvious damage going on here. You can see where the wood and the painter is failing, and it's pretty obvious that there's some sort of a moisture problem going on here. It could be that the ice collects in the gutter during the winter time and creates an ice dam. It could be that there's a problem with the way that the li roof lips over onto the gutter and creates some sort of moisture issue that's collecting up there. No matter what, moisture is at the root cause of this problem, so you're going to make sure that you find out where that problem is starting from and then turn around and fix the problem, fix the visual portion of this problem later. So the important thing in this case is you make sure you find out where the water is coming from first and fix that, and then you can worry about cutting out that wood and replacing it. So finally, let's take a look at this window down here by the basement. You can see the driveway's right here, the window's right here. Water is going to come down, splash back all over this wood. You can see some of the dirt, which is accumulated. You can see where the paint has failed because of all the excess moisture. And you can certainly see that there's a big missing chunk of the framing member around the side of the window. Solution here, you could either replace this whole section of wood. You could peel back any of the really rotten stuff, apply a consolidant and an epoxy to fill in this hole. But the main thing you're going to have to worry about is making sure that there's water is being mitigated away from this particular window. So as I said, there's not much area here between the wood and the ground. So you want to perhaps come out during a rainstorm. I know you're going to get wet, but keep an eye on what's happening here and see if there's anything you can do to mitigate um, all the excess moisture that's coming down. Of course, basic maintenance is always one of the main keys to helping prevent any sort of uh, deterioration issues, making sure that the paint layer is always in good shape and uh, that you're keeping an eye on everything throughout the year. The exterior of your home is exposed to elements year-round, so it's important to have a maintenance plan in place that includes a thorough inspection at least twice a year. Look for issues like peeling paint and insect damage, and then make sure you address the underlying causes as opposed to just the surface issues. By taking care of these small issues now, you'll be avoiding big problems in the future and ensuring that your home is in good shape for many years to come.